Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, we want to welcome you if you're in the sanctuary or if you are joining us online to the 11 o'clock traditional worship service here at St. Pete First. Uh, my name is Travis James. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we're glad that you have joined us for this uh, third Sunday of Advent. We have a nice service ahead of us, but before we get started in worship, I do want to highlight just a couple of announcements and bring them to your attention. If you're in the sanctuary, you will find this information in the bulletin, and those of you online, this is on our website. I encourage you to look for more information there. But the first thing I'm going to highlight is the prayer vigil that we are going to be having here in the sanctuary the week of Christmas, December 21st through the 24th. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. We're inviting you to make reservations to join, uh, to spend some time here in the sanctuary, here in the sacred space as it's decorated for Christmas. There are going to be prayers under each of the stained glass windows and an opportunity for you to come and to reflect in this place on the meaning and the significance of Christmas. So I hope that you will make a reservation uh, to spend some time here in the sanctuary uh, during the week of Christmas. Also want to highlight the drive through Living Nativity, which is something new we are offering this year uh, through our children's ministry and youth ministry. It is on Monday, December 21st from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And this is an opportunity for you to fill your cars with loved ones and friends to come and drive through and to get uh, the Christmas story in different ways as you move through our church parking lot that is here on our campus. So I want you to know about that as well. Also want to remind you about Christmas Eve. We're doing things a little bit different this year, but it's going to have the same meaning and significance. Our contemporary worship service is going to be outdoors. It is being held at Vinoy Park, and that is going to be from 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. We're inviting you to bring chairs or blankets, something comfortable to sit on uh, and to come around 4 p.m. That's when seating will start and the service will begin at 4.30. And this will be a great time that's led by our contemporary worship leader, Matt Winter. And it's going to be a fun, family-friendly service. So I want you to know about that. Also, our traditional Christmas Eve service is going to be afterwards at 7 p.m. This is going to be online only. It'll be streaming. And this is going to include our choir, the handbells. We're going to have a string quartet. And, of course, the pipe organ as it accompanies a service of lesson, lessons and carols as we move through the Christmas story, reading scriptures and singing songs together. So great opportunities in the next couple of weeks. Hope that you know that we uh, would love to see you at any and all of these opportunities, and we look forward to celebrating Christmas Eve with you, either at Benoit Park or online. Uh, lastly, before we start worship, we are wrapping up uh, the year 2020. Uh, many of us, I'm sure, are celebrating that as it's been a rough and interesting year, but God has been at work this past year, and we have continued to thrive in ministry here at St. Pete First, and we're planning to do the very same, if not more, in 2021. And so as we begin to look forward to where God is leading us and putting together the resources needed to continue being in ministry, we are looking at the budget and inviting you to also make a pledge and a commitment to be a part of those ministry opportunities uh, with an offering and a commitment to make a tithe next year. And so to speak about uh, where we have been in recent months and where we're going in the months and in the year to come, Pastor Craig interviewed one of our staff members, and so I want to invite you to turn your attention to the video and listen to what they say. Y'all, I, I want to introduce to you Scott Nieves. He is on our staff, and he um, does audiovisual, all kinds of things for us. Scott, thank you for just sitting down with me. You're very welcome. Um, where are you from? Just... Well, originally from New York, and I've lived most of my life here in Tampa, Florida. And the uh, bad thing about Tampa was when I moved from New York, there was no snow on Christmas. Right. <laughs> yeah, so Christmas is a little different. <laughs> yes, it is. Scott, um, what is your history in the church? How long have you been involved in the church? In this church? No, I, no, just well, in... I've known about Jesus, and I've been in church ever since I can remember. Hmm. Uh, I grew up in a wonderful Christian family, and uh, my parents both had a very strong faith and gave us wonderful guidance. Hmm. That's awesome. And I was very blessed with the parents the Lord gave me. And you have been in this church involved here for how many years? Uh, 11 years. 11 years, okay. And it, Scott, you need to know, Scott um, not only has been here for 11 years, but he comes way before I do Sunday morning and leaves after I leave. He suffers through three sermons every Sunday morning. Uh, he's, but, but you've probably never seen him. 
because he's usually up in the sound booth and or in, in the media center up there. And Scott, I, I thought they needed to, to meet you, but also they needed to just kind of hear what it's been, what, the things that we have had to do during COVID in, in your little kingdom up there. Tell us what has changed, what has been magnified um, since COVID in terms of what we're doing with cameras and all that. All right, well, before COVID, uh, we were just uh, producing the services with just one camera, okay, which kind of takes your production quality down to zero. Right. Okay. Um, before the COVID, I was putting together a system to upgrade what we currently were using at the time. And uh, we upgraded from one camera, we have four cameras now, uh, and we have very good production quality. Uh, before COVID, all the parishioners could see were like either the pastor and then the full screen words, or they could see the band and if they were singing the songs, you couldn't see the band while the words were being sung. So you could either see the words or you could see the band, you couldn't see both. Scott, it, it seems to me that we have um, probably purchased a lot of stuff. That, that to make this happen, yes. there have just been a whole bunch of things. Can you list off some of those things? What? Well, we purchased the projector. Uh, that's one of the main items. We purchased the switcher. Okay, and there's little Ultra Studio uh, devices that go in between the uh, Pro Presenter computer and the uh, switcher and then ultimately to the projector so we can project all that on the screen with uh, words and verses on the lower third. We purchased new cameras, we purchased uh, new TVs, and uh, we've upgraded the, the TVs in the sanctuary. Uh, we put in four 75-inch TVs and there's so a better viewer for our par parishioners on site here. So all kinds of things oh, that, that have benefited the viewer who's watching on, on YouTube yeah. um, or Facebook Live and also for folks coming back here. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Y'all, I, I wanted you to hear this because a lot of work has gone in during this pandemic where we've kind of been separated from one another, but we have been doing all kinds of different things, upgrading things, um, continuing the ministry of this church and, and understanding it to project beyond what we had been doing here and, and that, that it goes out to the rest of the world. And we want that to be um, an enjoyable experience for, for you and, and for anyone who's watching. That takes money um, and it has taken um, extraordinary amounts out of our budget um, to make happen. And so your generosity, particularly this year, truly matters for us um, as we seek to be engaging the world with the message uh, of the good news of Jesus Christ. God bless you, and I invite you to um, prayerfully consider what your pledge will be for 2021, but also want to encourage you to give generously this year as we try to finish the year um, in the black and, and um, to the glory of God. And again, we are excited about where God is leading us next year in 2021, and we cannot do it without you and without your generosity. And so let's join together in that. So that's it as far as announcements go. Again, all of this is on the website, but at this time, let us enter into this time of worship as Rick leads us in this morning's prelude.
let me open this with a word of prayer, and then I will invite you to join me in this morning's call to worship. Let's pray. Loving God, as we make our way through this Advent season, we join together with a collective sense of wonder and excitement and anticipation as we prepare to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, on Christmas Day. Because God, while we already know the significance of Christ's arrival and what that means for this world and for our lives, we make a point each and every year to move through this season in a new way with a newfound hope, a hopeful expectation that the arrival of Christ will continue to be significant to us in new ways this year. And so God, as we move through this hour of worship together, I ask that as we look to you with faith, as we turn to you with praise and thanksgiving, that you would establish peace and hope, joy and love in our hearts that is being offered by you this day. God, we ask that you would bless our time together, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we worship you in word and in song. Soften our hearts, silence the distractions so that your presence can be made known to us in ways that draw us closer to you and closer to the love that's available to us in Christ. In whose name we pray and all God's people said, if you're in the sanctuary, I want to invite you to stand, and for all of us, let us join together in our call to worship. The words will be on the screen before you. Love has come down to us this Advent season, divine love, which heals and transforms our lives. With great joy, we receive that love and share it with others. We open our hearts to all God's children, the last, the least, and the lost. The Lord has done and continues to do great things for us. Praise be to God who loves us so much and who challenges us to be people of joy in this darkened world. And let us remain standing for our hymn of praise, Joy to the World, number 246 in the hymnal. you to be seated and at this time I want to invite Michael and Annie Footlet to come forward. They are going to be lighting our Advent candle on the Advent wreath this morning and also reading to us and speaking to us on the theme of joy. Thank you. We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition. We decorate because it lifts our hearts. We decorate because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls with boughs of holly because tis the season to be jolly. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. God's decorations come as beautifications to our spirits. He decorates our hearts with hope.
He decorates our hearts with peace. He decorates our hearts with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of the season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because our salvation lies in the manger. Let us pray. Lord, we love the decorations. We love the candles lit here. When we smile, you do too. Please make these flames glow brighter in our hearts than they do so beautifully here. Let the flame of hope and peace and joy shine brightly in us for the world to see that you have brought them there. Amen and Merry Christmas. This time we're going to move through a time of prayer in this service, and we're going to begin with the collet, which is a congregational prayer where we join our voices together in prayer to God. The words will be on the screen in front of you, so let us pray. Lord of eternal light, we rejoice in your compassion for us. You send us your light and your healing love. 
so that we may become better representatives of you in this world which cries for justice and peace. Be with us this morning as we gather to hear your word for us. Amen. Let us continue in a time of prayer. Gracious God, in this season of Advent, we are preparing ourselves to embrace the significance of your presence coming into this world through Christ. God, we're anticipating Christ's arrival and we're preparing our hearts to receive that good news as it is poured out into our lives again and throughout this world in new ways. Because while we are uh, celebrating the good news that was announced many years ago, it continues to be good news that does not grow old. It continues to be good news that does not lose meaning. And it continues to be good news that guides our lives this day. And so God, I ask that you would fill us with the peace and the hope, the love and the joy as we walk alongside people who are in need of receiving this good news this season. God, we pray for those around us, those who are in our lives and among us who are sick. We pray for those who are in need of your healing touch in some way. Uh, we pray that an awareness of your peace and your comfort would be made known in this time and would draw near to those who are brokenhearted. We pray that your forgiveness would pave the way for those who are seeking reconciliation in their lives or in the relationships with the people around them. God, whatever the circumstances, whatever is taking place in the lives of your people, God, we pray that your holy presence would be made known to them made known in the ways that are needed the most, in the deepest cries of their hearts. Because, God, your presence is a presence that does bring the hope that is needed. It's a presence that fills us with the peace and the joy that only comes from you and the peace and the joy that we long for in our lives. And your presence is one that empowers us to not only receive the love that is offered through Christ, but to share it with those around us. But this morning we, we worship Jesus. We are uh, people who anticipate that hope that we encounter in this Advent season and upon Christmas. And we seek to live our lives in a way that follows in his footsteps and holds tight to the teaching that is offered and obeying his commands. And listening to the way that Jesus invites us to remain connected to you and one of the ways in which we do that is by praying and praying in the same way that he taught his disciples to pray, saying like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we're going to continue to worship through our tithes and offerings. And so if you've come into the sanctuary prepared to make an offering, uh, be reminded that there is a box by the front door and encourage you to place your offering in that box on your way out after the service. And for those of you online, there are ways to give electronically, but whether it's here in the sanctuary or online, let us give with gratitude and joy in our hearts, returning a portion of what God has blessed us with.
And our hymn of preparation is in the bleak midwinter, number 221 in the hymnal. If you're in the sanctuary, let us stand together and join our voices together as we sing this hymn. seated. It's great to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We decided to run the air conditioning as much as we could so that it would feel like a bleak midwinter morning inside here um, as much as possible, even though we're in Florida. Um, <laughs> glad you're here. <laughs> um, I wore a jacket. Um, we're running the AC because we need to recirculate air. We just, we're doing this for our own safety. You know, I, I had planned mm, months ago that Sunday in Advent we would talk about Christology, the second Sunday in Advent last week, Soteriology, and we did both of those and that we would talk about pneumatology today, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, and then we would do ironology, which is a study of, of peace, um, come next Sunday. And I, I think it's very important to study the Holy Spirit. It's important to think about the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but I just wanted to think about joy. Um, so I decided to scrap that and um, for us just to think a little bit about joy. And one of the things that, 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 that I found was that when, when I went home and I said, okay, let's think about joy, I, I sat in this big comfy chair and I said, what brings me joy? And I found myself smiling just because I had asked the question. And um, so let me ask you, what brings you joy? I, and I wasn't expecting an answer, y'all. It's, it's, it's okay that everybody's quiet. Um, it's kind of fun to think about. I will confess the first thing I thought about was a bicycle. I, I had shared with you last week that um, the first Christmas in Costa Rica, I, I got a bike. And I, I wrote about this a couple weeks ago that, that ever since that day growing up in Costa Rica for the next however many years, it didn't matter where the bicycle was. As long as I was on it, I was happy. The bicycle could be on the front porch as long as I was on my bike or if it was, you know, anywhere. And, and that's just um, one of the things that gives me joy. I was riding bicycle yesterday. I also thought it gives me great joy to eat with somebody. I just enjoy that. And I primarily enjoy eating with my wife. I just enjoy it when we go out to eat or, or eat at home, just sit down to eat. I enjoy it when we have our boys and our daughter-in-law over and we just hang out and we eat. 
And then I thought, if any of you in the room I have had lunch with, I enjoyed that. Or you at home, I've had lunch with a lot of folks. And I've enjoyed every single one of them. There's something enjoyable about knowing that you can eat whatever you want to eat and that there's good fellowship to go along with it. I truly find pleasure in that. I find joy in it. And there are lots of things that I find joy in, and in particularly at this time of year, there are reminders of joy. The word joy is all over. Um, in my house, we, we don't have really a mantle, but it feels like that. Janice put this joy sign up, and, 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 and joy is one of the, the big ornaments um, of our Christmas tree. And you can kind of see it in different places. We have had it um, in the, the, the vestibule as you walked in. Of course, nobody walks into the vestibule anymore. So I brought the sign here this morning so that you could see it. We've been greeting people with joy. Um, again, it, it's kind of all over. And we put it up in different places. Why do we put it up at Christmas time? I think we put joy up at Christmas time um, because, well, it appears at least four times in, in the second chapter of Luke. It is an important part of the Christmas story. I think it's an important part of the Christian religion in general. I mean, when you think about our festivals, our, our holy days, our holidays are Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus, and Easter, celebrating his resurrection. They are days of celebration. That's just what we do. We gather on Sundays and not on Saturdays because we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. That's just built into our tradition. It's built into our faith. It's just who we are. Other religions don't have celebration and joy as, as that central part of, you know, pillars of their um, religion. And um, for that, I am very grateful, and, and um, I want us to, to celebrate that. The problem with joy is that you can't just make it happen in your life by sheer force of will. You can't just stare at that sign and go, hmm, and just focus on it until I feel joy. It doesn't work that way. So, um, well, I, I, I suppose you can, you can create it momentarily, as I just described, um, you know, if you think about joyful things. But, but the, the joy was not thinking about bike riding. The joy is in riding a bike. The joy is not in thinking about having lunch. The joy is having lunch, right? I shouldn't say that this close to lunchtime. Anyway, um, you can't choose joy. We can't elicit it just by the force of our will. And, 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 and joy is, is more of, and I think it is, a feeling. It, it's a reaction. You know, something happens and then you feel joyful. As a community, we would feel joy. If the, the rays, where's Shirley? Oh, right oh, over there. If the rays would just settle down and stay in St. Pete, decide they're going to stay at the Trop, and, you know, that would just bring you joy, wouldn't it? Yes, and, and for the rest of us. Um, it just, if, if, if you've been unemployed for months and you finally get a phone call, a call back, and you're going to be employed and you're looking forward to going Monday to work, you feel joy because something has happened and emotionally you respond to it, that is joy. If you um, have been preparing for a child, and I'm talking about women, well, parents, um, and you've been preparing for a child, when that child finally comes after all of the preparation and pain and everything else, yeah, there's some relief and there's some consternation in it, but there's wonder and there's awe and there's joy when 
that child has finally come. That, that, the, the, the child is what produces the joy. And it's, again, it's not something that you can fabricate. It's something that comes first. You know that Gaither song, um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. It is because something has happened that then I can feel joy. The verse says, God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I have joy. Joy is not a discipline. There are disciplines. There, there are religious disciplines in our lives. We can decide that we are going to pray and that we are going to pray more often. And so we set our clocks early so that we will spend some time in prayer. Or we uh, fasting, you know, you, you decide that Tuesdays at lunch you're going to fast. And so, you know, you just set that in your, your alarm or your calendar and, and, and you're reminded of that and you do it. Joy is not that. And yet, joy is a command. We are told to do it. <laughs> Be joyful. No, just, just kidding. I'm sorry, I'm trying to interact with my wife, which is really hard when she's wearing a mask. Anyway, um, <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Paul gives that command. He says, rejoice always. And he includes that with a list of things that you can do. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Christ Jesus for you. But that first one, rejoice always, is hard to, to just do because somebody told you to do it. But he does. He, he says it not just in 1 Thessalonians. He says it in Philippians chapter 4. Remember that famous verse, Philippians 4, 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. This is important. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and our minds in Christ. A couple of things there. Um, number one, peace transcends understanding. But joy doesn't. I, I, I find it fascinating that in, in the, the contemporary English version, it reads a little differently. Can we pull that up? This is just verses four and five. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I find that interesting, by the way. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that anywhere else in the Bible does it say, do something, and again, I tell you, do it. You know, do not commit adultery. And again, I say, do not commit adultery. I mean, it probably should have said that, um, but it doesn't. This is, this is the only place where you get this kind of at least you can find, look, look and see if I'm telling you the truth. But, you know, it's the only time you get this repetition. But anyway, I'm sorry, bring that back. I started talking too long, Becky, sorry. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then the contemporary English version says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The NIV says gentleness, but the CEV says reasonableness. And I find that very interesting. God wants us to be reasonable, wants us to reason. And joy, if you're going to rejoice, and again I say rejoice, it has to be reasonable. There has to be a reason why you're joyful. Have you seen somebody fake joy? They kind of smile, but it's fake. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. But they're not. Joy, and, and, and joy as, as God wants us to feel it, is something that is reasonable. 
that, that has a reason for it that, that makes sense and that we know and we can point towards it. Um, at Christmas, that what, the, the reasonable offering that we have of, of our joy is the birth of a child. And, and, you know, you think of a baby and it's full of potential. And, and, and you feel that as a parent, but we as Christians looking at Christmas find in that child, in that coming of God in the form of a baby, a great reason for joy. Now, it doesn't mean that the joy has to be right here and right now. The joy can be something that we know is coming. When I think about childbirth, um, there's a pain that women endure. It's something that I couldn't do, right? There's a pain that can kill you. <laughs> and if the pain of childbirth happened to me, I would cry, scream, and then just die, right? But, but a woman will go through that, will endure that because of the joy that's coming. She knows that she is going to hold a baby and, and, and in that baby find the, the wonder and the awe and the love and, and all of that. And, and for the sake of that joy, she puts up with an incredible amount of pain. And this is true for Jesus as well. Um, it says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Let, let me read you the context of that. This is Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read to you verse 1 because... Um, because I just like verse 1. Um, I, I, I make you endure this verse um, at least once a year, usually around Halloween, around All Saints Day, where I read Hebrews 12, 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, what, what that means is, in a way, as we have celebrated it here, we just, there's this recognition that saints have gone before us, that Christians have gone before us, and they are in heaven, and, and they form this, this cloud, just all these people that look down. And because they're looking down on us, we want to run the race with perseverance. We want to do well. But let me keep reading. He says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy is the outcome that Jesus was looking forward to as he sat at the right hand of God. He put up with the pain and the humiliation and just the ridiculousness of the crucifixion. Why? Because he knew that if he did that, you and I would be reconciled with God. He looked forward to that and went through it. Looking forward to something and, and looking forward to a joy allows us to endure a lot in the present. So let me ask you, what are you looking forward to? What is there out in front of you that you are looking forward to? What joy is out there that, that, that is encouraging you to walk the walk today? As I asked myself this question, I had a very mundane answer. Believe it or not, I'm getting a bicycle for Christmas this year. I, and, and I'm very proud of this because I have a brother who, well, I've always thought he's awesome, but particularly right now I think he's awesome. He has a bike shop in Tennessee. And even though you can't get a good bicycle anywhere in the United States today, they're just not manufacturing them, 
I'm getting one. <laughs> and, 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 okay, so a very mundane illustration. I am looking forward to that. And because of that, I go through all of the rest of stuff that's going on. There's, there's a much deeper spiritual theological reason for our joy. And I want to share that with you. The reason for our joy, of what we are looking forward to, is because, listen, our names are written in the book of life. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent out his disciples to go practice the things that he has taught them. And they went out, and I mean, they had a great time. They performed miracles. They healed people. They cast out demons. And when they come back, they're just like, you wouldn't believe it. This was amazing. We cast out demons. We did all kinds of crazy things. And Jesus said to them, this is Luke chapter 10, verse 20, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven does that bring you joy? It should. You see, when your name is known in heaven, that allows you to go through, but it allows you to enjoy this life. If you know that your name is written in the book, you can relax here. There's something really wonderful about knowing that your name is written in the book of life, or it was actually written anywhere. Reservations at the restaurants. Nice to know when you get there, your name is there, right? Janice and I were, were out not yesterday, but a week ago, Saturday. Um, we were at Mayaka Park, and um, there, there is this canopy walk, and, and what happens is you go up this tower, and then you walk on a swinging um, bridge, and you walk out there in the canopy of the trees, and you arrive at another tower, and then I was anticipating that we would just go down, but you're invited to go up. And if you continue up the, the other tower, you see names of people on the steps. All the steps are full of names. It was a way of raising money, and, and we have done something similar in our fellowship hall. We have a tree down there, and it has names. And I always thought that it would be cool to, to put my boys, our boys' names um, on everywhere that we have encountered that idea so that at some point we could send them on some wild goose chase and some scavenger hunt and look for their names written in a church in Michigan and written in somewhere in England and you know, Disney and here or wherever. I thought that'd be cool because it's just neat to, to know that your name is written down somewhere. But what matters truly is that your name is written in the book of life. That if you died today, that you know that you would go to heaven and that the celebrity there, Jesus, would recognize you. I've always felt that, you know, it doesn't matter how many celebrities you know, it's how many people know you. And when we get to heaven, that Jesus knows our name, that our name is written in that book, is what truly matters. And friends, if you're not sure about that, you can be. It is as simple as, as, as praying and asking that God forgive you of the sins that you have, that you tell God that you want to accept the forgiveness that Jesus offered in his death and resurrection, and that you intend to follow him and invite Jesus into your heart. It's that simple. And then you know, and now there is this, this, this source of joy that is in you. We need that. Because let me tell you, there are all kinds of things that kill joy in our lives. As I thought about this um, and, and things that kill joy for me, one of those things is comparing myself to others. If I compare myself to others, I, I will feel really good I'm doing better than you. But pretty soon, I'm going to find out that I'm 
not doing as well as you and you've got more than I do and you're, you know, better looking than I am and you're, you know, all these different things. And <clears throat> suddenly I'm not feeling joy. Joy is not to be found by looking around and comparing ourselves with others. And again, for me personally, what kills joy is worry, is anxiety. Now, it's not that there aren't things that are going to make us worry in life. It's not that we are exempted from any of that. I mean, think about Mary, Mary and Joseph, and the things that caused anxiety in her life. An angel came and told her that she was going to have a baby and that there was going to be no sex involved in it. I was thinking about this. This is, this is just for free. This is just something I was thinking about. And, and, and you know, you write me, tell me what you think. But um, I just wonder if Mary wasn't already pregnant when the angel came and talked with her. I, I guess that would preclude her saying no, but I, I just, the idea that she felt something when the angel talked and she knew that there would be no sex involved in the birth of that child. What am I going to tell mom? What am I going to tell Joseph? The penalty of adultery in this country is death. Eight months, nine months later, her husband says, we're going to go for a walk. And it's a three-day walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And they may ride a donkey. Not the textbook thing to do when you're nine months pregnant. She had a lot to worry about. But Mary, Mary acquiesced to the will of God. She said, be it unto me as you say. And she trusted the angel, but she trusted God. Trust is the antidote of worry. And when we trust God, then our, our, our anxiety decreases. And we can work on trust. You can practice trust. You can pray for trust. And when we begin to feel that, then the joy that Jesus promised to us will come. Jesus is at the end of his ministry. He's about to ascend to heaven. He's praying to God out loud so others can hear him. And he says in John 17, 13, I am coming to you now. He's speaking to his father. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus wanted us to experience and know the complete, perfect joy that he had because of what he accomplished. That, friends, can live in us. And when we accept that, some things happen, and I, this is a list that I found this morning reading the children's message that Emily Strong put out. Many of you have received in your email. She says, we are known, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are never alone, we have purpose, we are eternal. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that because he lives... We are known, we are loved, we're forgiven, we're never alone, we have purpose, we are eternal, we have joy. And Lord, I ask that you would just enliven that in us, allow us to see it, to feel it, and to know that it comes from you, the true source of joy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close this morning, not singing about joy, but about the cause of joy. We're going to sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Would you please stand with me as we sing?
please receive this benediction. May God the Father who created joy intends us and all of his creation to live in joy. May God the Son who came to enable joy and gave us an object of our joy. And may God the Holy Spirit who allows us to feel joy go with you now forevermore until we meet again. Amen. I don't normally say this to you, but I, I want, well, first Merry Christmas before you go anywhere. It's just great to hang out. I want to invite you, if, if you are able, if you need to go, go. But the postlude this morning is pretty amazing, and I want to invite you to stay and listen to it. Um, so if you need to go, please go. Um, and if you want to go, please go. Um, but I invite you to, to, to listen. Rick, bring it on. Merry Christmas, all. God bless you. Have a good week.